morning and welcome to our live virtual open house at the North Bennett Street School. My name is Sarah Turner. I'm the president here and I am so glad to be able to show you all of our full-time programs. Um, and today we'll be visiting our book binding program. You'll be guided as always by Rob O'Dwyer um, and he'll introduce you to faculty and students and the projects that they're working on. You'll get to see this incredible shop, all of the equipment, all of the places where people do the work that they do. And uh, you'll get to answer, um, ask and have questions answered throughout the visit. So thank you so much for being here and I hope you, hope you enjoy the, the walk through book binding. All right, so we're going into book binding right now and you can see the sign says workshops. Uh, the space here is shared with full-time programs and our continuing ed courses. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, please check out our website and look for some of those short courses. Jeff, how are you? Good, how you doing? Welcome. Glad to see you all. Yes, this is uh, this first room uh, is a, a space that we share with continuing ed and it is our classroom teaching space. You can see down at the end here, uh, a demo table uh, and a big screen that we're using to show close-ups of uh, some of the work that uh, that I'm doing and my uh, co-teacher Martha Kearsley who's not able to be here today. Uh, Martha's here usually uh, one day a week and she works on a particular portion of the curriculum based around the repair and conservation topics in particular. It is a two-year program in, uh, that, that we call a hand bookbinding program and repair and conservation is kind of a, a, a concurrent uh, uh, aspect of the program because it's a big part of the demand for the skills that students are learning here. But what we are doing um, is focusing on hands-on work on developing bench skills, bookbinding bench skills that are useful for any application in working with books. Um, I put out some samples here and I'm gonna run through them kind of quickly here. And um, then we're going to, uh, and, and that's just samples of things that we've been working on, uh, models and uh, uh, demonstration pieces that we've been doing this semester, a few things that we will be getting to shortly in the, in the program. Then we're gonna go check out some of the other rooms. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the shared large equipment and then we're gonna take a look in the bench room and talk to students. And I wanna make sure I give plenty of time for that. And if time allows, we'll come back in here and we can take a look at, at, at any specific models or talk more about them or answer other questions. So I'm gonna give a quick run through of some of the stuff that we do. Here in the very beginning, uh, in the first year, the first year cohort starts working on some what we call non-adhesive binding structures. Most of those are medieval uh, books. Uh, some of these are what we consider kind of medieval paperbacks, basically. Um, that's what they start with. The program focuses on Western bookbinding traditions and the codex in particular. So this sort of general structure that we're thinking of. It does not work chronologically per se because aside from these uh, relatively simple medieval bindings, it's sort of easier to work uh, almost backwards chronologically. Uh, and so we do a lot of stuff uh, uh, where, where we're working on simpler techniques, structures that have been simplified over the years and work back towards the more complicated things. So I'll try to do a bit of a run through. Uh, as soon as we finish with the non-adhesive uh, work, we get into case binding, which is really more of a 19th century uh, and recent kind of uh, development where the covers are made separately from the book. And you can see an example of it uh, here that uh, is, is not put together <laughs> with, the, with the case made separately from uh, the binding. And that's, uh, that is what your typical hardback book is like today. Um, 
We also get into uh, titling. These are some direct foil stamping pieces here. And I think one of the students is actually in the other room doing some foil stamping right now. So you'll get to see how that works. Uh, we do a lot of box making. The uh, typical uh, clamshell box is, is just one type of structure that we use. It's sort of, it's perhaps the most, in terms of basic boxes, it's sort of the most common uh, uh, and most protective kind of enclosure, but we make all kinds of different protective enclosures. That is a very popular uh, item, especially in preservation and conservation work as well. Um, there's just a, 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 an unfinished tray that goes on one of these to see, to demonstrate where the cuts happen for all of these kind of things. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna say we also uh, very recently got into some really simple modern type structures. This is just an adhesive binding, which is actually what your most of your uh, most of your bindings today are made this way, as opposed to these that you can see um, have been sewn, or you may, may be able to see that they've been sewn. And I know one of the students is working on that in the other room, so you'll get a little sense of that kind of structure. But this is just a simple, uh, what we call a double fan adhesive binding with a limp paper cover. And this is another uh, structure that the first year students have been working on recently. Uh, we call this a serial binding or a cut flush binding, and it's kind of a, a common uh, common uh, technique in libraries for binding uh, newsletters or other serial publications. But it also makes a really nice notebook kind of kind of thing. Another recent thing that we've been doing uh, with the first years is looking at this variety of sewing techniques, and the real purpose for that is to understand the influence of various factors on the, the action of the book. And so by trying to hone in on just uh, the variable of the sewing structure and the different ways of you using the sewing supports, we can look at the fact that the books open very differently if they're sewn, in this case, on a what is this one? This is a herringbone sewing on double raised cords uh, versus taking that same cord and flattening it out uh, and sewing in a more modern technique, just lap sewing, and how much, uh, how much uh, wider that opens. There's not necessarily one better than the other, but it depends on the the quality of the materials and the kind of action you're looking for in, in the binding. Um, although I would maybe say that this lap sewing on tapes is a little less structurally satisfying than some of the others that we've done here. So that's a really interesting project that gets the students thinking about uh, the actual action of the binding. We're about to get into, uh, when we come back from break, we're going to get into some more historic bindings again. Um, this is a, a type of a German style paper binding. Um, these are late 18th century, early 19th century. We're basing the, these models off of this um, particular historic example that I think is from 1806. Uh, and it's just, it's an interesting structure using uh, simple materials. Uh, a lot of times people think of these books as being temporary, but this is definitely was not a temporary binding. We know because it's been trimmed, has edge decoration, a lot of other features tell us that this was meant to be the finished structure, not a temporary holding pattern. Uh, and they're quite elegant. It's covered, um, with a paste paper, which is a type of uh, decorative paper that binders have uh, traditionally made. Um, and there are some samples over here on the, on the table of some papers that, uh, these were not made by students. Those are some of my favorites from a couple of, uh, 
uh, paper makers that I know. And also over there you're seeing some marbled papers, which the students will be doing. Uh, the, the brighter colored ones are what they're going to be doing this year when we have guest instructors Dan and Regina St. John from Chain of River Marblers. That is a modern acrylic uh, based marbling. And the ones on the left over there that are a little more muted are a watercolor uh, marbling. They, they call classic marbling. Uh, and those are m more common on the historical kind of bindings that we see here. So these, these books uh, that I'm talking about w that are full paper bindings in particular are often covered either with paste paper like you see here. And this, this, is, this is a paper that is actually made by a German uh, decorative paper maker named Suzanne Krauss. Um, but the students make these kinds of papers. I don't, I'm, I, I'm too lazy to, <laughs> to make my own. Uh, and then, uh, uh, well, there's lots more to come in the first year. We're, we'll get into leather, uh, to leather bindings, uh, especially leather uh, based case bindings and boxes and things like that and introduce that kind of stuff. But here I'm gonna start showing you this rest of this lineup is stuff from the second year students. And the, one of the first projects that we do with the second years, we call, uh, in America, we call uh, millimeter binding. Um, and it's, uh, they are bindings that have very small quantities of leather, which is why we call them that. Sometimes very small quantities. This one may be hard to catch on film, it's so small, but they just have leather caps, head and tail caps here. Um, and, and otherwise it's a full paper binding. Um, I believe the Germans call it an Edelpop bond, which is a fine paper binding. Um, and ours are based a little more on Scandinavian book structures, uh, Swedish and Danish structures. This is a, a kind of a cutaway model showing a couple of the different styles. This lower part I consider kind of the classic, what we would call classic millimeter binding structure. This top part that has a leather running along the whole head and, head and tail would, ha would have on the whole head and tail, uh, we call a rubo binding. Um, let's see. Uh, and these are frequently covered with paste paper as these all are. Um, this paper was made by one of my students. Uh, these papers uh, were made by a decorative paper maker named Madeline Durham. Um, again, all, all stuff that the students do, but I'm too lazy to do my own, so <laughs> I use other people's papers. Um, more recently, uh, we've been doing, in the second years, they've been doing a lot of uh, gold tooling practice, what we call finishing, uh, various finishing techniques. This is the in-progress demonstration plaquette. We, we, we call a sampler plaquette. And it's just to show a few different uh, types of uh, traditional leather decoration. So gold and blind tooling. Uh, when it's tooling without, without uh, gold leaf, we call it blind tooling. Um, some decorative tools in gold and blind of different styles. And this one has some onlay work going on. It needs to be gilt still. Uh, so that one's a bit rough looking as is this little circle over here. Um, but this, so this is in process. That's what the students are working to finish. The second year students are working to finish right now. And that's just developing some basic tooling skills that they're going to need for some of the upcoming projects that they'll be doing. They also just uh, have been working on uh, a very classic kind of English style leather binding that they had the option of doing either in full leather as a practice piece for some of the work that we're going to be doing or they could do it in quarter leather. Quarter leather is something like this or, or half leather has just a leather spine and leather corners. Um, this, uh, this style is a, is a traditionally made book with laced on boards, uh, meaning that the, the sewing supports are used to lace on the uh, boards themselves. It's put together and then covered uh, in leather after 
uh, we've gotten that far, which is more traditional than the um, case bindings that I was showing you earlier that the cover is made separately. So we consider this kind of thing to be a true binding. Uh, and this one has a uh, 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 nice kind of English style uh, um, uh, marble pap end papers with this sort of exaggerated turn in area and stuff. So, and just simple tooling on it so that they can apply something uh, to a real book as opposed to practice boards like, like we're doing here. Uh, it's a little, a little more daunting. Uh, what we're about to get to, um, they'll, they'll be jumping into the second years when they return from break are leather rebacks. Um, so here is an example from last year's uh, uh, project on that, where what we've done is uh, lift off the original leather, uh, put a new leather spine on, which in this case was stained uh, to match as closely as possible to the original materials there. This one's gotten a little damaged. This was the demo piece. Sometimes I get a little sloppy on the demos, show them what can go wrong. I always tell them that the mistakes like that are intentional. I, I make those sacrifices so that they'll feel better about their own. Uh, and then it also has some repair work done in the inner hinge area. And again, this, this paper was toned in there in the inside hinge uh, to, to match or, or camouflage the repair uh, with the... Um, uh, uh, with the rest of the covering material. This one brings up another thing that we will be working on in this style of uh, sort of very common in the 18th century, but really from the 17th century into the 19th century. These calf bindings, which are stained and sprinkled in a way that allow them to mask flaws in the leather, um, but also they can be very elegant types of decoration without doing a lot of tooling. So I have some samples here of stuff that we'll be doing that are, um, well, this one, other than the additional work that's been done on it is simple sprinkling very much like what you, much like what you see on this one. Um, although this has some resist, uh, and, uh, uh, combinations to create a little more, uh, flashy pattern in it that is hard to see now, but was at one time probably really, really attractive. Um, another really classic one is this uh, panel style binding, sometimes known as a Cambridge panel. Um, that's one that they may apply uh, using, using templates, uh, using stencils, I mean, to, uh, to do the sprinkling and staining. Um, this one has some Brazil wood uh, added into it, so it gives it this uh, uh, reddish uh, hue. Um, this is a very poor example of, uh, of the way this, these uh, stains are used to create kind of tree patterns. The very traditional one, I should have pulled out an example of a traditional one. It really does look like a, a tree. Um, I call this little demo one, uh, um, uh, bush calf instead of tree calf uh, because it it's a little small. It's not really a fully developed tree. Um, and this is uh, an example of uh, a full leather version of that style of calf binding that would be kind of a classic 18th century style. Um, one of the kind of common blind tooling patterns that you might see on that. Another feature that's really common on these is uh, both the red, usually red edge decoration and the gilt board edges, which were done even on books that didn't have any other tooling on them. And then they, they will often, fancier ones anyway, will certainly have a, a marbled paper, marbled end papers. Um, this is a little simpler version that's maybe a little more 19th century use of that sprinkled calf. All of that, by the way, is done after the book is covered in undyed leather, it's stained in a two, two or more part process 
to develop the the uh, base color and then the sprinkling which is done with a ferrous sulfate um, let's see uh, and these by the way are sewn on raised cords laced laced on boards although this one was sewn on recessed cords which is a little more 19th century kind of thing uh, let's see then the other thing that they've just been given is one of their major assignments for the year in the second year is to bind what, what we call the set book project. Um, they are all given, and this is what it is this year. Um, they're given an unbound book and the assignment to bind that in a, a sort of a deluxe full leather binding with some kind of decorative work. And these are called fine bindings or sometimes called design bindings. Uh, yeah, this year they're doing this, uh, The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. And uh, they just got this, got their marching orders on what they need to do. This is one uh, uh, somewhat unfinished one <laughs> from a demo from the book from uh, couple of years ago we did uh, this Randall Davies and his books of nonsense um, uh, but they but they they're required to do something uh, decorative it can either be a very modern kind of artistic conceptual take or it could be a very traditional kind of tooling design I like everything that we do in this program and like these examples that we were looking at here of the calf bindings were interested in historical styles of decoration uh, historical techniques and what we're mostly interested in is execution um, and good execution of those techniques so on this project they've been given a lot of instructions to avoid getting into really uh, avant-garde kind of creative work what I really want to see is how they can do, uh, you know, well executed work that is super planned out. So that's a, um, that's a major project uh, that they'll be working on uh, off and on over the next few months, actually. Um, and then another major project, which we'll get to, which I, people like to uh, know about, is this sort of more gothic style binding. This is a bit of a modern take on it, but it is a wooden board uh, structure. Uh, we're usually looking at something kind of uh, 16th century approximately for this type of structure. It, it almost always includes some kind of metal class, which we, which we will look at how to make um, uh, at least simple clasps of these uh, styles. Um, and then I'm going to step to the other side. You can stay right there, but I just show a couple last little things before we go in the other room. Um, a number of other things that we work on are making and modifying the tools that we use. And we consider that to be a really important part of becoming a craftsperson is uh, being able to uh, uh, modify your tools to work in a professional way. So. One of the things that the students, uh, all the students worked on uh, earlier this year are making some knives. So uh, this is a, an in-process, uh, uh, basic sort of English style uh, paring knife. This is a lifting knife. Uh, they do some other metal working like making these little triangles for making all those fancy cuts on the on the box trays that I was showing you. These knives are made from power hacksaw blades. Um, we grind them down and shape them in a um, uh, on a, on the grinders over here. Uh, this this machine and a couple others. Um, and they also make their sharpening kit. Uh, part of which includes um, this stand and uh, the plates that we use for sort of sharpening stones, I guess, um, which, we, uh, which we like to use a, um, a micron graded uh, grit that sticks to these and then we can keep replacing it. 
Um, it's a nice, it's a nice simple way to uh, have flat sharpening stones, and we make this little stand to hold those plates, and uh, we can replace the surface and keep keep things nice and flat. And it's a good way to introduce them to some general metalworking skills, uh, making this whole structure. Another thing, a little more on the primitive side, is uh, very important to bookbinders are bone folders. Um, when the weather gets nicer again uh, this spring, we will be making bone folders like these out of, uh, mostly out of elk bone. So that's upcoming for uh, uh, tool making and modification. Um, let's go in the other room and take a look at what's happening in the uh, shared equipment space. Great. And then talk to the students. So we call this room the print shop um, in so far as we do printing in the bookbinding program here. It's actually um, mostly foil stamping. And what we're doing is uh, using uh, these heated machines. Nick is doing it right now. And you guys might want to squeeze in there and see how she set that up with uh, brass type. Uh, how are you? So she set that up and uh, then we'll stamp um, either directly or on label material um, uh, with usually with a foil. Gold foil in that case. Oh yeah, and that's the gauge right there heating up? Yep. We're at 179, 180. Nice. All right, this shop, this, this space is where we keep a, a, a number of the larger pieces of equipment, stuff like that. Obviously, uh, students don't each have their own uh, foil stamping machine, but we have several of them in here that they can share. Um, including a larger scale one back here in the corner that is, uh, we use more for larger, larger dies and things like that. That's a Kensal stamping machine. Um, all of these cases are full of type uh, that we use uh, for, for that process. And then this is also where we keep uh, book cloth and uh, back behind you guys are all the flat files full of uh, papers that the students are either making or purchasing uh, for the for the supply uh, for the projects. Um, a number of the supplies are provided so these kind of general use supplies like book cloth and uh, book board and paper and things like that are all kind of uh, used uh, throughout the space by everyone. Uh, but some things like leather, uh, we provide leather for some specific projects, but then uh, students want lots of different colors and they want different things from each other. And so they buy their own uh, leather for the most part um, and decorative paper they either make or purchase uh, based on their own particular needs. So let's go in here to the uh, bench room. That's where students ha each have their own space. And I think that you guys can see uh, a little bit of a variation of what students are doing. So we're going to make Alexa really nervous here and come up right behind her while she's <laughs> doing some gold tooling. And she's... Uh, uh, it's, it's really helpful when a group of people come and walk around right behind you when you're doing that. Perfect. The gold leaf blows around and things like that. Um, so she is working on that sampler plaquette that I was talking about. She's going to lay some gold leaf on that 
on that surface, uh, which has already been sized. And she put a little very light grease on the surface to help grab the gold leaf. Thanks, Alexa. We're grateful. <laughs> yeah, don't. It's OK. Like, <laughs> this is like one of the hardest things to do as a, 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 a demonstration. So <laughs> it's right. very nice of her. We're to, live without a net. This. So she's got a she's got a, a heated tool there. Um, which we generally overheat and then use that cooling pad there to uh, gauge the sizzle and figure out how roughly how hot it is. And then she's going to strike that impression that's already in the leather in this case. And it will activate the size that is on there, the adhesive that's on there, which is a shellac based size that we make. Strikes that with the heated tool, and then she'll clean that away. Sh just show us, show us what, show, uh, show them close what it looks like right now. And then you don't have if you if you want to clean it away and show the results, you can. <laughs> this is the nerve-wracking part. Did it work? Did and, it work? And and so uh, we kind of clean away that excess gold and take a look and see if. Uh, if the gold stayed in that impression. Looks good from here. It looks yeah. good. It looks good. Nice. Nice job. There are a lot of different ways of doing gold tooling. This is one slower method, but it's very good uh, for fine binding work. And it also is very good for, for those of us who don't do gold tooling every day, all day long. The quicker methods require you to have a really good sense of the heat of the tool and the amount of pressure that you need. And you're trying to, you're trying to strike the impression and get the gold to stick all, all in one go. And that requires a lot of experience. This, this method takes a lot of practice as well, but is a lot, uh, a lot more controllable. Jeff, we had a question come through yes. the chat, which was, do students design their own tools or, or tooling, I think? And I can recall there was a student here a, a while ago that created tools that, that were like the elven alphabet from Tolkien, but I think that's a side project. It is. We, so, um, Along with some of the other metalworking, clasp making, and things like that, I teach uh, some basic tool making. Uh, so the finishing tools, um, I'm going to grab one of Alexa's here. Uh, this one would be fairly complex to make as a beginner. <laughs> um, and this tool actually comes from a collection uh, that was once owned by the Club Bindery. Uh, and we received a couple of a couple of uh, years ago now, we received a really generous donation of a mm, couple thousand <laughs> decorative tools that are part of that collection. But a lot of modern work is done with less traditional uh, tools like this and more sh simpler shapes, things like that, uh, that, that can be used to kind of build up patterns and things like that. And especially those kind of tools, I do teach the students how to make those. And what they learn from that can be applied. So yes, a couple, uh, it's, been, it's been a number of years ago now, but yes, one student made some, made some shapes that they were able to use for, uh, for that uh, Elvish uh, alphabet and they titled the, I can't remember which book they did on it, but it was, it was, a, it was a, a labor of love. <laughs> some of those things, like the tool making, uh, I, I, I show some very f fundamental kind of work on that. We're using brass and bronze for that. Um, but, th but the amount of time that students spend on that kind of thing is, is totally up to them. Those are really optional projects. It, it uh, makes me think with, as you get introduced to so many different things that if a, if a student has an interest to go deeper, uh, they're welcome to do that. And maybe you or someone within your network, you can connect them with 
people to go in those that's, directions. That's exactly right. So they're sort of they're sort of there are requirement elements of the curriculum, and then there are a lot of topics that we get into, and that's one of them that some people may never do that in in their career. And I would say the vast majority of bookbinders never make their own finishing tools. Like it's not a common uh, a common activity for bookbinders, but it's an interest area of mine. And so it's something that they get a chance to do and play around with a little bit. And then it, it, it's like you say, Rob, the uh, students have, they have these required projects, but then they're going to spend more time on the things that interest them. So some of the students may spend a, a, an, an excessive, let's say, amount of time doing gold tooling, but, but some, some are really more interested in working in the conservation field, and they, they may and sh probably should spend a lot more time doing conservation and repair treatments for their portfolio than making design binding kind of things. So let's look at a couple other things that students are working Great. on. Um, I don't know what Kaylee's working on over here, but uh, Kaylee's in the first year. She's do oh, she's doing oh, some guarding. So that is repairing uh, the damaged folds on a book that was in pretty poor condition and needs, uh, was, was completely disbound uh, or finished <laughs> disbinding as the case may be. And now those folds are a little bit damaged from the earlier sewing and uh, spine linings and possibly a little bit damaged from the process of, remo of, of, of removing all of that. And so she's mending that with uh, some Japanese tissue And we use a lot of uh, Japanese and Korean uh, papers that are very strong uh, and yet very, very thin. Mostly Kozo fibered papers. And we use those mostly with paste uh, to, um, to apply repairs to tears and things like that. And I think another student is working on some uh, some mending with those tissues. We had another question, Jeff, yes. come across the chat, and, and I believe the question was, you know, is it, um, uh, can you combine other education, continuing education, um, maybe before or, or during or after the 18-month uh, accredited career training here? And I know from my conversations with you, uh, you know, we offer continuing education classes. We started at the top there um, mentioning that the continuing education courses for bookbinding here, which uh, just opened up again, so you can check out our website and see what's available there. Um, uh, that is a common thing for people to do to get some experience or to, uh, you know, uh, decide whether or not they want to make the commitment at this level. Uh, towards career training. And then there's a number of other places around the country and around the world uh, as well that give you um, uh, different angles. Can you talk about that a little I bit, can. Jeff? Yeah, so we would consider the program here to be kind of a foundational uh, set of bench skills for bookbinding and conservation. And there, it is very focused on the hands-on stuff, as I said. And I would say, depending on people's career path, uh, and choices, they often, this is just one component of their training and education. So we've had quite a number of students do um, additional work uh, at uh, either, either in a master's conservation program. Uh, there, is a, there are a couple of programs overseas that students have gone to for more conservation, ad additional conservation training especially the more science side of it, which we do not, we, we focus on the hands-on, we don't focus on the chemistry, and uh, we don't do a lot of focus on the theoretical, although we, we definitely talk about the um, ethics and the, uh, the, the hands-on side of it, almost all the treatments that we know of out there. 
Uh, but some of those programs are going to give people exposure to, uh, to, to elements of conservation training that we simply can't do in our time frame here. Very much focused, where we're very much focused on this uh, uh, broad range of foundational uh, hand skills uh, for, for bookbinding. Um, uh, additionally, I myself am a graduate and I was very interested in more in fine binding than in conservation. And I went to, uh, there's a school in Colorado called the American Academy of Bookbinding. And they have a focus on fine binding, uh, particularly French style uh, fine binding. And that is a program that I did that I considered kind of a, a follow up to what, I to, to what I did here. It's a workshop based uh, um, school. so. Students do pick and choose the topics that they want to do, and they can, uh, you, you can graduate from that program, but you can also take individual workshops. Um, and so th those are two examples of the kinds of uh, additional training that people do. But another very common pathway for our graduates is to get what I would consider more on the job training. So there are a lot of internship and fellowship opportunities and our graduates will do those and kind of piece together a number of different uh, uh, learning opportunities to, to go farther in the conservation field. It's very common and the most common. Uh, 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 one other thing I should mention is a, a, a very common second degree kind of thing is a uh, um, library school. And that, that, in combination with North Bennett Street School, has been really successful for a lot of our graduates going into conservation. And in fact, <laughs> here's a student that came here from, uh, Abra came from uh, a library school before she did this. And, uh, and will likely, I hope, be successful combining uh, these, these uh, education uh, uh, experiences into uh, a good career. Yeah. What are you working on, Abra? Uh, well, I'm currently uh, just building some cases. Uh, I haven't cased in these books yet. Uh, they are exposed cloth hinge uh, books, but I haven't cased them in. I've just made the cases, and I'm waiting to do some stamping that you guys saw earlier. Um, but Jeff is right that I am in general, uh, very interested in the conservation side of uh, what we do here. So I thought I'd pull out something that I worked on. Um, and I did a reback of this children's book, which is really delightful. Um, but the part that I'm most proud of is right inside here, where I repaired the hinge with a piece of tissue. Uh, and the tissue was blank. Uh, but what I ended up doing was uh, very delicately painting the tissue, color matching the end papers here, and uh, painting the tissue before I put it on um, to uh, match the pattern on the end papers so that I wouldn't have to disrupt this really beautiful end paper here. Um, and that was a challenge. Um, and I did it a couple of times before I got it pretty, pretty well right. Um, the uh, inside here, I did the same thing on the front as well, um, but I was really quite pleased with that. Um, and color matching has been something uh, that I've really enjoyed doing so far. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's my, my pride and joy right there. Um, nice. Yeah. I think one of the things that <clears throat> is a good opportunity for our students Thank you, Abra. is uh, the chance to do stuff like that. that you, you may not frequently go quite to that length, uh, uh, certainly, not, certainly not if you're working in a library, but especially it's, it's one, of the, one of the things that we like about the way we work here is that we consider the needs of a lot of different clients. So institutional collections might not expect that, or they might for certain work, uh, uh, probably not a cloth case binding. They probably wouldn't expect that. 
But a private client probably would and probably would really prefer that kind of treatment and that level of aesthetic uh, um, uh, addition to the work. Um, and so that's, uh, they, the students have a lot of opportunity, a lot of bench time. And so they are able to kind of explore those kind of things. And one of the things that we like to think is that they have a chance to do those things. If you can do that, you can certainly do a simpler, <laughs> Uh, a simpler repair. So uh, let's see what else. I think a uh, uh, couple other students are working on repair work right now. Oh, this looks great. That looks fun. <laughs> this is fun. It is an old photo album that belonged to a friend. She took all the photos out and gave it to me because she thought I'd have fun with it. Um, and I am getting ready to take the two parts and put them back together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this remaining cloth hinge that was keeping the two pieces together and I'm gonna glue that back in. And then I'm gonna take the paper that fell off of it and glue that back up on top. So it is exciting. <laughs> When you opened it, I thought, oh, somebody's hiding something in there, like some <laughs> keys or something. But it makes sense. It's a photo book. Yeah. There is one photo that is left in it, which is kind of fun. So no idea who that is, but. Oh, that's great. I think you should convert it to a book, though, to keep all your money in. You know, I could, I could yeah. just not put any yeah. photos in it just and just, that yeah. yeah. <laughs> My own secret book. That's great. <laughs> great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And Mimi's working on a repair project too, a reback. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to work on cutting my hinges the right size so that it fits into the, where I lifted the end papers and the book cloth. Um, so yeah, so then it'll fit under there, and then, yeah. That's great. I love all of these old, old books. Uh, did you choose this? The uh, I just found it at a thrift store. I just, you know, I'm trying to find, I'm not trying to spend too much money on fixing these books. Sure. Um, so like, I, you know, I pay, maybe paid like $5 for it. Right. Um, I'm not really like, interested what's in it just like just something right to structurally on. How, yeah. right um but i mean you know i do have uh books that people are gonna give me to fix later on so yeah cool we have a lot of thanks for sharing we have a lot of uh we we have some some limitations and some uh opportunities when it comes to repair projects we're not connected to uh an institutional collection and so that means we don't have a, a constant stream of books to repair um, but on the other hand I think if we were connected to such an institution the types of books and the types of projects that we would be working on would be would be according to the needs of that collection right and uh, there, there are good things about that but there are also some really good opportunities for just practicing on books that are in the one to five dollar range and uh, I hesitate to say it on uh, camera but sometimes sometimes we find a book that would be perfect for a certain type of repair and it might accidentally get broken in a certain way that makes it a good candidate for practicing <laughs> a specific technique. I think that's fair. Uh, Collateral and, uh, damage yes, in, the, in the name exactly. of education. So we might damage something, but we fix it <laughs> afterwards, if that's fair. Uh, um, and, but, but otherwise, students do kind of, uh, students are responsible for kind of uh, selecting books to work on, to practice on. And then we do a lot of work for, uh, for clients as well. So. Mimi was mentioning that she might, you know, she has some books from friends. Rachel is working on something that she got from a friend. We get a lot of things from friends and family. Once, once somebody finds out that uh, they know somebody in bookbinding school, right. uh, people come out of the woodwork with that kind of stuff, and that can be good and can be bad. Uh, but, uh, but 
we also uh, then uh, have a lot of inquiries that come through. We have a, we have a commission, a job and commission uh, site on our, uh, on our website that you can post something for a student or graduate to work on. And I think that's that there's a there's a thing right on the landing page uh, to, to post a commission like that and students once they get to uh, once they've practiced a certain range of things uh, Martha and I uh, turn them loose on those projects as well and give them guidance and support on on how to work on projects like that so some uh, if you're interested in that students will take on projects uh, of that variety uh, and if it's not appropriate for a student, we will push it towards a graduate, okay? That's great. Um, let's go over here and see, there's one more student in. Some of them, some of them are not here today because we're going on break now and uh, some of them had travel plans, but EJ's stuck over here by herself hey, EJ. Uh, today. And she's working on a new book hey, and right uh, she's working on sewing, that kind of sewing that I was talking about that is common on a, modern style of binding, lap sewing over, uh, oh no, I'm doing a you're doing a link stitch, stitch right, right now. now. Sorry, I you were working doing... on lap sewing earlier when I saw you. Yes. Okay, she's doing a link stitch right now, which is a type of unsupported uh, sewing structure, but she was on these others doing lap sewing over Ramy band. Um, yeah, so that's what that is, and that, oops, turns into, a rounded back case binding, um, or those will. And then this one will be the cut flush, which okay. I know that Jeff was Zero talking binding, about, yeah. which will look more like that. And you'll be able to see the sewing that I'm doing right here on the spines. Great. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very fun. Thanks. Well, we can step back in here if people have other questions yeah, or want to have questions about specific models. Thank you, EJ. Uh, I think we're about out of time. I don't remember what your I, schedule was. I think we've was. got another four or five minutes or so. Oh, okay, we did great, have a question great, yeah. uh, that just came across. Do we deal with water damage things? And it's funny, when you were talking earlier, I can remember looking out my office window in the old building and seeing you with like a... a, a uh, a pile of books and a hose, water damaging Speaking things. Speaking of damaging things, <laughs> I got a lot of flack from one of the neighbors when they walked past our old parking lot and caught me uh, watering a pile of books in preparation for a disaster uh, response workshop. Um, uh, and yeah, they had some choice words for me on destroying books. They were discards from local libraries and I went through them even after that and made sure there wasn't anything that really was uh, that's great important or anything uh, a lot of it was more ephemeral kind of <laughs> material but we do uh we do disaster response uh work um like that we do not do a lot of repairs on uh wet or or recent uh damage like that here in class because we don't have the facilities to deal with mold abatement. And mold is something we don't want to uh, expose people to without the right safety equipment and precautions. And so we don't do a lot of work with that actually in our, uh, in our class or for clients. Uh, that is a, a, a limitation. And so if you have uh, really, if you have moldy books or books that have been wet and are sitting around, we may not take on that project within our facility here. That's, that's okay? fair, safety but, first. But disaster response, and we've, uh, uh, we sadly or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, um, uh, one year back in the old building, there was a small fire upstairs and the sprinklers went off, put out the fire, everything worked appropriately, but the water leaked down from that uh, from that floor through our lights and onto our stuff, <laughs> including a portion of our, our own library collection. And the students had not very long before done the disaster response workshop. And, we, uh, and, and they, they were able to uh, come in that morning and uh, 
process the books uh, in the proper way and we were able to send some books out uh, to be frozen and we were able to uh, dry some things out quickly to avoid mold issues and uh, that's one of the big problems is that uh, if you don't handle it correctly right away uh, it becomes a bigger problem. So, but that gave us a chance, a, a very real world and very personal <laughs> opportunity to, uh, to deal with some of the stuff that the, that the students learned. Jeff, uh, I have a question yeah. for you. Um, if you could give uh, some advice to anyone who is thinking of coming in this direction, um, it, it's funny, when we started right here in this space, I, you, you, uh, there was a term you used about the books and you said it give, that it gives you structural satisfaction mm, yeah. and I thought oh okay this we should put this somewhere if you are interested in structural satisfaction this yes. could be for you <laughs> but what advice do you have for uh, people out in our audience that are that are uh, thinking of coming to North Bend Street School to study bookbinding well so that's a good example of I guess the kind of things that appeal to people and if they do you might be interested in that there's a long list of stuff, and I know we, uh, here the faculty talks about uh, some of those things and the types of people that are interested in the subjects that we teach. And uh, I remember talking with the locksmith instructor about, you know, a lot of uh, people that are really into puzzles uh, um, often find themselves very attracted to uh, the, that program. Um, yeah, there are a lot of things that might attract you to this. Um, in terms of sort of uh, pursuing this, um, I often recommend that people do take some hands-on workshops as a starting point. I think uh, one of the big things for um, a lot of our students is figuring out uh, the difference between having a passion for books, which a lot of us have, and the difference between that and actually working sometimes on sometimes in a very repetitive way uh, on them all day long, every day. That's very different from having a passion for reading or liking books as objects. Um, and that does it's not to say that people who can't like both of those things, they, they often do. But I recommend that people get, get some hands-on experience and get a taste of what that's like. Um, there are a lot of places out there that teach workshops. The, the North Bennett workshops um, are particularly good if you're considering this program because it is there most of them many of them are taught by graduates many of them are structured in a similar way to the way we do things in the full-time program so there's some benefits to uh, to that but aside from that I it doesn't matter to me if prospective students have taken a workshop here or at the San Francisco Center for the Book or Minnesota Center for Book Arts or any other of a, of a of, of wide range of places. Um, another thing I would say is I recommend that people do some research on the pathways uh, that we've been talking about. So our graduates go on, many of them go on to work in conservation in institutions. Uh, but a large number of them also do what I would consider traditional hand bookbinding. And quite a few of them uh, have their own small businesses and do that work privately for, for private collectors. And, the, and in those cases, they often do a very wide range of things. They might do fancy new deluxe bindings. They might do small additions. They might do repair work, um, restoration kind of work. They might do a, a lot of different things. It's one of, the, one of the benefits of this program is that you do get that foundation in all of those things. And you can choose to specialize, and you will, uh, but depending on the path you take, you might also end up finding yourself doing a wider range of work than you thought you would to begin with. But I recommend doing a little research on education opportunities in the field because depending on how you want to work in the field of conservation, this might not be the best way. I mean, a master's program might be more appropriate for you because it might uh, lead to a, a, a different, a slightly different career path. Most of our graduates, most of our students come here because they want to work at the bench is what is how we describe it as opposed to uh 
being in a, in a more administrative kind of role in conservation where you might not get to actually work on books as much. Uh, our pathway is really geared towards the people who want to do bench work of any variety. So researching what those opportunities are. If you're more interested in, in, in book arts in a wide uh, array, you've probably noticed that most of our work that I've shown here is uh, traditional historic uh, styles of bookbinding, and we make a lot of blank books. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're making these as models, as structural models, and it's an economical way. We, de we don't dig into content uh, very much. That set book project that I talked about is sort of one of the more uh, traditional, uh, more, more, more creative opportunities for people in the sense that they get to be a little more artistic as opposed to a lot of the work we do, which I jokingly say maybe isn't creative because I'm making, you know, this is, co this is copied from, from a book that I have like mm -hmm. as closely as possible. You may or may not define that as creative. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, and so um, those are things to look at. So if you're more interested in content and uh, book art structures that are a little more uh, 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 creative and non-traditional structures, this might not be the right program for you. You might be interested in, a, in, a, in one of the book arts programs. Um, but I think there's, we have a lot to offer and a broad range of things to offer, but we, f we do focus on certain things, you know, as much as we can, we keep the focus on those things. And this is a time period that you can, uh, that you can focus on those things. If you're interested in some of those other things, you have a chance to do that as well. So uh, outside of class time and beyond your time here. So. That's great. And Jeff, yeah. em, uh, employment rates are pretty high coming out of this program they and employment opportunities. They are fairly high. I don't have specific numbers, but, uh, but yes, we've had, we've had good results in our program. We have good employment in the field. Uh, we have uh, good results with students that have decided to pursue additional education that that is related usually to this so as i was saying before some of them either before or after will get a library degree or choose some other additional training like uh, or or degree that that supports a career in this um uh, so we have graduates that are either doing further education or employment at at virtually a hundred percent they're doing one or the other that's so, great uh that that's a good thing and Jobs are uh, not, it, this is not a, a lucrative field. I would not describe it that way, but there are jobs and it is, um, our focus is, is on preparing people for employment and to, to make a living doing some type of this work. And we've had good success with that. That's great. Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the tour and all the information. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll be hosting an information session, and I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna see if I can flip this camera here, and there we are. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for coming in, everybody. Yep. And I'm gonna go back into the bench room here, and just say, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of Open House. Uh, enjoy winter break. Happy holidays and happy New Year.